Hi, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, on this week's episode, once again, I'm joined uh, by my good buddy, Stephen Holmes. Uh, Stephen's been on with us before, and um, he was sharing about uh, his plans to move him and his family to Nepal, to Kathmandu, Nepal to uh, reach out to the Israeli Jewish community, this massive uh, expat community of Israelis that live uh, in this neighborhood in Kathmandu. And you know, we discuss theology and, and, and sort of all of the things that the Lord has been speaking to him through his study of the scriptures. Stephen, uh, welcome back to The Underground. Thank you. All Good right. to be here. So again, I wanna start where we actually started last time you were on. And this is, um, in order to understand all of these things, in order for Christians, uh, disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, to understand the context of the gospel, you really have to begin with what I'll call the priority of the gospel to the Jew, that, that the gospel is and always has been, really, most especially to the Jew, and, and to try to understand the Lord's arrangement, if you will, between the Jew and the Gentile, and, and how Paul lays that out so clearly. So go ahead and jump in, because I love when you talk about this, the clarity that, uh, that you just bring to the whole issue. Yeah, I think just to start, I'm just reminded of, of how really the gospel is the issue of the cross and what Jesus taught with becoming the least of all, the servant of all, and taking up your cross and following him. Um, you have this, this gospel that is a stumbling block, right? It forces... When, it, when a Gentile comes to the gospel, we are forced to humble ourselves before the fact that Israel was chosen and we were not. Well, we were the pagans. We were not chosen by God. He chose a people amidst the peoples, and this people was Israel. So we're forced to humble ourselves there. And, and now that offends a lot of people. But Paul clearly says, you who are Gentiles, before you came to faith, you are without God, without hope in the world. That's right. And I mean, With he, no hope of Messiah, Ephesians 2, right? Yeah. Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. Yeah. I mean, so this is not, you know, this is not Gentile bashing. This is Paul saying, hey, recognize where you came from. You were That's a right. pagan. You're, you know, before your family became believers, you were pagans. You didn't have any hope. That's right. And so, the, you know, this is, uh, yes, it's offensive. Sep he says, separate from Messiah, separate from the idea that God had chosen someone after man sinned to restore man to relationship and to a resurrected state with God in perfection. Yeah. So he does that through the Jewish people. Now, on the other hand, the Jew has to humble themselves before the, f the fact that God has given their people this blindness, this... Um, he, what he calls it partial, right? This partial blindness that and, and hardening of heart until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And so there's the issue of the cross is that Gentiles have to humble themselves because we were not chosen. The Jew has to humble themselves because of, of the unfaithfulness within the covenant and the Lord having now hardened them during this, this time is extending mercy to the Gentiles, but unto Israel being fulfilled in the promise of God. Yeah. And so when we when we talk about the gospel, um, I, I, I like I love how Paul says it in Romans 15. And we mentioned this last time, but but Paul actually says in Romans 15, 8, he says, I say, well, he says just before this, he says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Right. Instruction is the word Torah. Right. The Torah was the instruction was written in earlier times, was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have 
hope. And so he's identifying a biblical hope here that was written in former times. And then in ver- he's going to get down to verse 8 and say, For I say that Christ, or Messiah, has become a servant to the circumcision. Again, ethnic Israel. On behalf of the truth of God, to confirm the promises given to the fathers. And let's just simplify that. Jesus died on the cross to confirm the truth of what God said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah. so for to sum up the death of Jesus in that way, it's rarely done that way. And Paul says clearly here, this is how I interpret the life of Jesus on the earth. He came as a servant to the circumcision. He humbled himself, Philippians 2, became obedient to the point of death to confirm that God's promise to Abraham still stands firm and he will return a second time to fulfill that. Yeah. You have so many Christians that will say, they'll read a verse in Hebrews and they'll say, the new covenant does away with the old. Yeah. (laughs) And they conflate the Mosaic covenant with the Abrahamic covenant. Uh The Mosaic covenant can concerns the rules and regulations to possess and remain and be blessed in the land. Whereas the Abrahamic covenant is clearly over and over and over again, reiterated as being everlasting, eternal, forever, you know, uh, uh, just throughout the scriptures. And then you have the New Testament, which affirms that the Abrahamic covenant will be fulfilled through the finished work on the cross. It has not been done away with. And yet you have many, many Christians. They don't even know what the promises made to Abraham concern. They don't even know what it's really about. That's right, yeah. And they say the cross did away with it. Uh-huh. The cross finished it. Jesus realized all those promises in himself, and now we're in a better covenant. But that would be interesting if Paul believed that for him to say, no, no, no. And he's com- completely the polar opposite of that doctrine, right? False doctrine. He says, no, Christ is died on the cross to confirm what was said to Abraham, the promises given to the fathers. And so you're exactly right. Most people today, I think there's nothing in our mind about the future fulfillment when Jesus returns being the fulfillment of the promises God made to Abraham. And so we're really lacking an understanding of what was the truth of God concerning the promises given to the fathers. And so we go to like Genesis 12 and and start to identify those. Right to the very beginning. Right to the very beginning. And this is the this is the epidemic, if you will, in the church. So many Christians are fundamentally Old Testament illiterate versus the first century believers who were raised on these things, who heard these things read in the synagogue week after week, largely in oral culture, much better memory than, than the cell phone generation, the smartphone generation. And so these were the things that were embedded into their minds and their spirits. And these are the things that we need to familiarize ourselves with as well if we want to understand what Paul was talking about. That's right. I I think I encourage people as often as I can that, that to understand Genesis through Deuteronomy, to understand Torah, God called it an instruction. Moses sat in the tabernacle and penned verbatim what the Holy Spirit, what God asked him, to write from Genesis 1 to Deuteronomy 33. And so you have him writing exactly what God wanted as an instruction. And I I like to say that literally prophecy was the prophecy of what would come about ended in Deuteronomy. And Joshua through Revelation is the fulfillment of what is instructed and told of in the Torah. And so we have to return to that understanding. So often we call it the Pentateuch, you know, in theology today. And so often we're just, we kind of, oh yeah, yeah, I know what those books said. And, and oh yeah, Leviticus, that's not even important anymore. You know, yeah. I took Pentateuch in seminary, <laughs> you know, and, the, the, and then that's it. We and did it and it's it. past moved on. Yeah, but no, this is the instruction. If you talk to any Israeli, any Orthodox Jew today, what are they continually cycling through over and over? What is David proclaiming in Psalm 119? I'm looking into Torah and these things being the foundation of our entire Bible should provoke us as Gentiles to want to understand what is actually said there. And what's said there is simply the promises given to the fathers, right? Amen. Amen. So now when we do turn, we turn back to Genesis, Genesis 12, Genesis 15, just in summary, simplified, what were the promises? What were the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Man, there's a lot of them. I mean, 12, 15, 
17 specifically, but but the, the simple promise and the basis of gospel, the basis of good news for a first century Jew, for Paul and the apostles, for what Jesus teaches them in the 40 days regarding the kingdom is your people is promised to be a light to the nations of the earth from this specific piece of land, a light and a blessing. Yep. And so that happens through the operation of Messiah and Jesus' second coming. However, that blessing can't be finished just because Jesus came once. If we put everything at the first coming of Jesus, we holistically lose the entire point of the gospel and good news of the future fulfillment, restoration of yeah. Israel. Yeah, yeah. So the good news, the gospel, we call it the gospel. It means the glad tidings, the good news. Yep. The good news that John the Baptist, that Jesus, that the That's apostles, right. that the early church was proclaiming, it was the good news concerning the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Right. And so it concerned the kingdom that was proclaimed throughout the Bible, throughout, right. the, throughout exactly Torah, right. throughout the prophets, throughout you know the Psalms and all these things. So here's this kingdom that's proclaimed. And so this is the point, is Jesus died on the cross, yes, to, so that your sins could be atoned for, right. that they could be wiped clean, so that you will be able to participate and inherit the kingdom. The kingdom. Yeah. So the gospel is unto something. It's not merely someday you'll die and you don't go to hell. That's right. And it's like, that's, that's true. And that's good news that you don't go to hell, right? But it's like, but it's, it's like piece of the hope. There's such an incredibly, you know, detail rich good news. And we don't often proclaim it. We don't talk about the details throughout the prophets that talk about the restored kingdom, the nature of that kingdom, the things that we will do in this glorified resurrected body. And That's right. it's just the gospel uh, within Christianity, within the Christian church in so many ways, it's so truncated. It's so watered yeah. down. And there's just such a beautiful story to tell. And I think often we lack, we, we haven't dug into the scriptures. We don't have an, a cl enough clarity in the scriptures that we just, we lose the beauty of that message. So, <clears throat> That's right. so you've been, you've been uh, working on this timeline. And this is yeah, essentially a timeline, I mean, begins with Genesis, just a very linear timeline. That's right. It moves forward from creation you know, throughout the covenants to the cross, right up to the return of Jesus, the establishment of his kingdom. That's right. And this is just sort of a way to communicate the gospel. This is, in a sense, uh, the, the systematic theology that you've been developing and working through. And this is also, you know, I've had John Harrigan on, uh, yeah. you know, mutual great friend of ours. We've all been working through the scriptures together. So this is largely uh, reminiscent of a lot of the stuff that he lays out. Yeah, in, in his book, The Gospel of Christ Crucified. That's exactly but right. Go ahead and just jump into some of this. You know, when, when we're trying to explain the gospel from a biblical mindset, it's often understood through the lens of a very linear story, a very That's linear right. timeline. That's right. Yeah, and so <clears throat> John Harrigan is a, I mean, being our close friend, he really opened my mind to perceive biblical theology in this linear format. And, um, and so this timeline is based entirely off of, of his ideas, but I kind of wanted to take it further, put it in my own language and, and make a one page diagram that you could sit down with someone and say, look, here's 150 scriptures. These are the five points of biblical theology that are continually emphasized by the apostles in the book of Acts and by Paul. And these scriptures prove that this is what the Bible is emphasizing and to give a linear you know, whole description of the gospel so that I can sit down and in one conversation, I've done this on numerous occasions. It can take, you know, three to five hours if a person's really interested or it can take five different settings of one, of one hour. And by the end, I've just seen amazing results and people just going, I, I finally feel like I understand the gospel and the Bible more than ever before just through one conversation. And that's the, the passion of my heart is just, for us to have understanding in, in, in the scriptures and, and the very Jewish gospel. Yeah, and let me say this too, you know, because you're humble and, and, and a, a lot of this understanding was sort of uh, handed off to us by John, but the work that you've done, the way that you've articulated it, 
you know, in your language and, and the things that the Lord's shown you is, is fantastic and excellent. And, and it, for anybody who's read any of John's stuff or gone through any of John's stuff, I also encourage you to go through Stephen's stuff because, I mean, this is the way the Holy Spirit works is he, you know, he, he gives everyone different pieces of the mm -hmm. puzzle and, and just the revelation and the wisdom that you have is commendable and, and edifying. I'm, you know what I'm saying? It, it, yeah, it really you. will bless you. So, um, so <clears throat> yeah, go ahead and just continue to jump into that. So I think if you just work through this, we're thinking linear 6,000 year timeline. Literally, that's what we're, we're doing as, with a foundation in Kiliasm, which I'm sure you've talked about before. Um, just that the earth is like a thousand years or that a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. And as he created the earth in six days and then there's the seventh day of rest. This age will be 6,000 years and then will be the millennial rest described in Hebrews and Revelation 20. Yep. And so we're, we're working in a 6,000 year linear timeline. Right. And so the gospel, I say, call this the five pillars of biblical theology because we want not necessarily a systematic theology that's just plucking out different things, but what is a biblical theology articulating from the Bible itself these, these, these very ideas, and it is systematic and it is linear. And I also call it the witness of the good news of the gospel from Genesis to Revelation. So it's important to just first off say the gospel starts in Genesis 1, right? And, and sometimes that's an unfamiliar idea to people. But if we, if we just think that the good news is simply creational, God created the heavens and the earth and he created man, therefore he possesses them as his creation, literal creation, six days rested on the seventh. He created the heavens and the earth and he created man. Those are his possessions. And he's called the possessor of the heavens and the earth uh, by Abraham in Genesis 15. He's recognized as being that one divine God who's three in one. But what's interesting is if you, if you look at the bottom of that first pillar is... Um, is that the only other thing in scripture that's given creational language. You have the heavens, the earth created by God, man created by God. But then he distinctly says through the prophets, I am your creator, O Israel. And it's not just ambiguous like your people I created. It's very specific. <clears throat> Isaiah 43, he, he very specifically says, but now thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. And so you have this very creational language, very personal to God, given to Israel. And so I always like to highlight that from the beginning in the first pillar that Israel's not just this later thing, right? He formed Israel. He did through the womb of delivering them from Egypt but through the promise to Abraham. And so I like to put Israel in the, in the first column so that we're developing our theology of what creation actually is, and he gives creational language to Israel. Yeah, his promised plan from the very beginning was to redeem all of creation that's right. through a particular people. Yep. That's his plan, that's the way he's laid it out. We need to submit to that. That's right. We, can't, we can't buck against it. That was, this is the way he chose to do it, and we can't just rewrite, you know, yeah. rewrite his story. Yeah, we just humbly submit to it in obedience and yeah. say, you are God and I'm not. Yeah. Right. This is what a uh, friend of ours, uh, Reggie Kelly, refers to as the scandal of peculiarity or the scandal of election. Yeah. You know, it offends people that he That's chose right. a particular people. But this is the way he's this is the way he's done it. So he's chose it. Yeah. And that's that's kind of what's happened. So if, if you push through there, like, of course, man's in the garden, man sins, very literal, true story. And then that promise comes right at the top of the covenantal pillar of Genesis 3.15, that he will crush the head of the serpent who deceived man through this promised seed, mm -hmm. who is the Messiah, who will, of course, push through and become Jesus, the descendant of Abraham, right? Yeah. The descendant of David. And so you have the covenantal pillar that our gospel is wholly covenantal. He has based the promise in Genesis 3.15 and brought it through the lineage of Abraham. And so his choosing of Israel is just the continuation of what he promises in Genesis 3.15. Yeah. It's just simply continuing the progress in linear time, in physical time and space. Yep. You know, as a completely sort of side note, 
It's interesting that when you have this, this introduction of the promise of the Messiah, the seed of the woman, yeah. and it says that he will crush the head of Satan, that one of the arguments for the Islamic um, centrality of the end times is that repeatedly then throughout the prophets, the Lord talks about crushing, crushing particular peoples and nations at the time of the return of Jesus. Yeah. And they're always Middle Eastern Islamic dominated majority nations. And so that theme of crushing his enemy, like he's, as he moves forward, he starts naming names. Wow. He's like, you know, Moab's head will be That's crushed right, yeah. in, in Isaiah 25, Numbers 24, Edom, Moab and the sun, you know, so, <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, the Amalekites and the Midianites and such. So it's, it's interesting that that theme is carried through. And once he starts naming names, mm it actually sort of validates something that I've talked a lot about, but that's just a side issue. Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, and so the gospel being covenantal, we're actually, we push all the way through to exactly what you're talking about in the gospel. That's, that's kind of the culmination. And so just in that pillar, we highlight the covenantal priority in the New Testament of Israel. Um, but, but what's very important is that in the covenant, are these conditions that God gives at Mount Sinai to, to Israel through Moses. Deuteronomy 28 through 32, I encourage people, I mean, Deuteronomy 4 through 6 and Deuteronomy 28 through 32, Leviticus 26 are chapters we cannot dig deep enough into, especially Deuteronomy 32 culminating in the Song of Moses, um, which is <laughs> Ha'azinu, right? In Hebrew, it's, it's the song of Moses that he was supposed to teach the sons of Israel to remain as a perpetual witness to Israel. Very interesting song, so detailed, but but I think it had a melody and it was this song that was to bear witness to Israel all the days of their life. And it really hits hard God's controversy with them because of idolatry. And, um, and then talks about the restoration. The very last stanza in the song is, but he will render vengeance on his adversaries. He will atone for his land and his people. It actually says, rejoice, O nations, rejoice, O Gentiles, mm. for he will render vengeance on his adversaries and atone for his land and his people. And I believe that to truly be a, a linear prophetic picture of, again, now we're pushing through this apocalyptic thrust that we see in the scriptures, right? This thrust that's centered on this future restoration from Genesis three, right? The promise is a Messiah is going to come and crush the head of that serpent. So that's the thrust of the scripture, this event in the future, this event in linear time that will come and he will crush the head of the serpent. And so again, when you have like in the song of Moses, this, this testimony of this one coming, rejoice, O nations, he's going to render vengeance on the enemies of Israel. And he's going to vindicate his own name and atone for the land and his people. So the atonement of the land of Israel makes the, the, the restoration in the end focused on a piece of land and on his people. Mm -hmm. So there you have the land and the people that, that, that Paul and, and the apostles also focus on. Yep, yep. So, um, and then of course we get to the time Jesus returns. Now obviously at the cross, he's provided atonement That's in right. order that we can inherit the age to come. Yep. But then you come to the actual kingdom. You yeah. get, and this is just a you know critical piece of the various pillars of biblical theology. Yeah. Jesus begins his reign on the earth. Yeah. And this is a, this is a subject I love to talk about. Most of the church rarely delves into it. Mm. Uh, just touch on that real briefly before yeah. we uh, before we wrap up. So I think the most important thing that we could just get in the last couple minutes is that within the covenant with Abraham, Moses, and David is promised the kingdom. Yeah. With Abraham, he promises a piece of land and a people, yeah. right? With Moses, he promises a law and a temple. Yeah. With David, he promises a, a, a ruler on the throne, government. So if you have a piece of land with people in it, operating under a law, with a temple for worship, and, and a king reigning on a throne, what do you have? That would be called a kingdom. A kingdom, right? right? So exactly. simple. And so the fulfillment then, when Jesus returns, <laughs> name of a popular book. When Jesus returns, when the Messiah descends on the clouds of heaven, Zechariah 12 and 14, right? They look on him whom they pierced. He descends on the clouds of heaven right down to the Mount of Olives. It splits and he's doing the, this the delivering 
of the people out of the hands of their enemies. But then begins the grand millennial reign when the law goes forth from Zion. Why do we see so many people uh, still on the earth in the prophets? Why is he sending to the king of the north to come to the Feast of Tabernacles? I, li I like to pinpoint it very specifically. The millennial reign is Jesus holding fast to his promise to Abraham. The Jews Amen. will walk in their irrevocable calling. They will be the law going forth from Zion, speaking to the king of the north. They will be sent to the isles and the coastlands that have never heard his fame nor seen his glory. They will be fulfilling that calling finally. And that is the hope of every Gentile that they, we attach ourselves. One man grabs the, 10 men grab the garment of one Jew and say, we've heard God is with you. And truly he is. The Messiah is reigning on the throne of David from Zion and his kingdom. What does 1 Corinthians 15 say? This is the play of a thousand year reign. He is entirely okay with this. He will sit on a throne as a physical king and reign until all enemies are put under his feet, until his government extends around the circle of the earth and every enemy is put under his feet. Then comes the time when he delivers the kingdom to the Father that God may be all in all. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful picture. I mean, you know, I love talking to you about it. I love hearing you articulate it. And so I'll put up the, um, the link so that folks can access even just your blog as you're working through a lot of these things and download the timeline because yeah. it's tremendously helpful. And um, believers need to continually discuss and chew on and just work through these things. And this is how we encourage one another. You know, That's this right. is how we encourage one another and strengthen yeah. the confession that we've made, the good confession, the confession of our hope. So, Stephen, we are pretty much out of time, yeah. but it's great. We could talk about this forever. Um, folks, I just want to thank you so much again uh, for being with us. Um, I look forward to seeing you next week. I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. For this week's episode, we are offering the new Coming Battle for Jerusalem teaching DVD set. This dynamic three DVD set features six teaching sessions addressing critical issues related to Israel in the last days. Unravel one of the most controversial passages in all of the scriptures. What do the scriptures really say about the coming restoration of the kingdom of Israel? What will the world be like when Jesus returns? Finally, we will unpack Jesus' final sermon known as the Olivet Discourse. Filmed live on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, experience the sermon from the very location where Jesus himself taught these things. To order my newest teaching DVD, go to joelstrumpet.com, go to the store, and click on the Coming Battle for Jerusalem teaching DVD. This DVD is the perfect companion to my latest book, When a Jew Rules the World. If you buy both together now, you get When a Jew Rules the World, retail priced at $25.95 for only $15. To get this special, go to joelstrumpet.com, click on the store, and click on the Coming Battle for Jerusalem special.